Uh, I will give a first uh, quick introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have Professor Hong Yang Zhang here to give us a talk. Uh, Professor Hong Yang Zhang has been an assistant professor of computer science at Northeastern University since fall 2020, and he received his PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 2019 and a Bachelor of Engineering from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2012. And he is currently interested in algorithmic and data centric aspects of machine learning and network analysis. His recent work touches on theory and methods for multitask and transfer learning and algorithm for network centrality and epidemics on social mobile networks. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy. All right. Uh, so is, is the screen share working right now? Yeah, it's, it's working. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, thanks for the introduction for the invitation. So yeah, I'm guessing that uh, everyone must be <laughs> working, uh, working on the New York deadline right now. So I just, I just be, um, you know, just be like sort of more, uh, more high level as opposed to like really going to the technical uh, details. So that's my plan. And, uh, you know, so if you're, if you have questions at any time during the talk, please, Feel free to uh, feel free to interrupt. All right. Yeah. So yeah. So you know some background. So you know clearly, uh, machine learning and uh, more specifically deep learning has been very successful over the past uh, decade. So, for example, these days, uh, you know a lot of things that we're using uh, right now, like uh, machine translation systems, rely on uh, the use of a very large uh, deep neural network. And uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, have heard, uh, you know, the the amazing uh, AlphaGo uh, gameplay agents uh, from DeepMind. So these uh, you know uh, these achievements have uh, inspired a lot of uh, recent works uh, in the, in in the broad area of uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning. Now, on the other hand, uh, you know there there are also a lot of uh, uh, mysteries you could say that are. Uh, they're uh, sort of inspired by these uh, achievements. So uh, perhaps one of the most uh, well-known, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you uh, uh, knew about this work, uh, which is from uh, iClear a few years ago, that uh, uh, modern uh, deep neural networks uh, have enough capacity to, uh, to memorize uh, the training data, even when the, the labels of the training data uh, are, uh, are randomly uh, perturbed. So, you know, so, so this this has led to this uh, terminology is now called uh, overparameterization, meaning that a model has uh, more variables than uh, has more variables than the amount of data that uh, they are trained on. So, you know, in this uh, overparameterized regime, then. And, you know, of course, uh, the neural network, we now understand that uh, neural networks have enough capacity to memorize uh, the training labels, even when they're wrong, right? So I guess by now this is pretty uh, standard, but back then, uh, you know, there were, I think the, uh, this paper received a lot of uh, uh, discussion back then when it was, uh, when it first appeared. So, you know, uh, so, so after this work, there has been uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, studies. I'm sure uh, many of you here have uh, have done works here and here. I just uh, you know listed some of my personal favorites, but I, so I, I do apologize if uh, you didn't see your work here. Uh, so it's just a very biased uh, selection. So you know, so th there has been a lot of work that you know really tries to understand this uh, mystery of why uh, of why a large overparameterized neural network generalizes well. Uh, to let's say from the training data to the test data, right? So, 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 so for example, here there are three, you know, uh, three, uh, three very uh, exemplar uh, lines of work. You know, the first one is that uh, there has been works that come up with that come up with uh, margin or norm based uh, bounds for deep, deep neural networks. So these results typically characterize the capacity of uh, of a neural network in terms of the the norms of the of the uh, layers, and then another line of of work uh, tackles the non-convexity of the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, such as uh, you know 
uh, understanding the implicit uh, bias of, uh, of uh, let's say, the initialization of the, the SGD algorithm, or how does the width affect, uh, affect the, 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 the algorithm behavior, right? And uh, yeah, so another uh, line work, perhaps more from uh, more from the statistics community, is that uh, you know, uh, there has been work that uh, uses a random matrix theory to characterize the asymptotics of uh, the generalization errors when the sample size divided by the dimension of the problem go, uh, converges to a constant, right? You know, so there's this line work that talks about the benign overfitting in uh, over parameterized uh, linear regression and so on. Now, so of course, uh, so so these works are, are great. Um, so but today, what I'm going to talk talk about uh, is kind of like uh, slightly going beyond this uh, perspective of uh, generalization. For example, uh, what if we 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 move to uh, out of domain generalization problems? Let's say when the training and the test data are somewhat different. So one example is that uh, the data might evolve over time. For example, this happens when you're dealing with uh, spatial temporal data, right? Or when you, uh, let's say, you know, one example is that maybe you, you train a model on natural images and now you, you want to apply it to medical images. So the data distributions are, are somewhat different. Now, uh, you know, from a more uh, practical standpoint, uh, here you could ask, uh, how would the knowledge that I learned from one task help another task, right? So this notion of uh, transfer is closely related to uh, generalization uh, and uh, out of domain generalization. And uh, so this idea of uh, multitask learning is that maybe we can combine uh, the knowledge from several tasks and use them together to help uh, uh, each other. So that's the, you know, that's the, um, the broad, you know, the background. So specifically, <coughs> so specific, um, I'm going to talk about the um, three problems here. So the first one is, uh, is some work that we did to understand uh, uh, the phenomenon of uh, negative transfer uh, in multitask uh, learning. So here uh, we we uh, here we we provide a case study of uh, of a uh, of, of, uh, of multitask uh, learning in a, in a high dimensional setting. And we, we, we provide uh, some, some new theoretical analysis using uh, random matrix uh, theory. And uh, the second problem that, uh, that I will talk about is, uh, is how do you do uh, transfer learning from, uh, from a pre-trained uh, neural network? So here, uh, here we're, we're gonna use, uh, use some uh, Peck Bayesian uh, bounds. Uh, for analyzing uh, transfer learning algorithms. In the end, if I have time, I will talk about uh, another uh, closely related problem where you know we have some we have uh, several groups of uh, data distributions in our in our training set, and uh, somehow there is a there is a distribution shift across them. So how do we deal with uh, these kind of uh, shifts uh, among groups in the training data? So that's the the plan for my talk. And so the first part is based on a uh, joint work uh, with a few folks from uh, Stanford and UPenn. Um, and it appeared at uh, iClear 2020. And we also have a follow-up work that's on archive right now. So, you know, so I'll just give you an example of uh, multitask uh, learning. So in this uh, problem, you start off uh, simultaneously trying to learn uh, one neural network uh, for several tasks at the same time. So hopefully each task uh, could help, you know, could help uh, predict uh, the other tasks. So for example, uh, suppose you want to, to build a system to detect, uh, uh, detect uh, you know, objects uh, in an image. Now there, there are many kinds of, um, uh, of objects here. For example, uh, the vehicle needs to detect uh, pedestrians. It also needs to detect uh, traffic lights. So, so, uh, so, so this is a, a this is a multitask learning problem where you want to make several predictions simultaneously from one image. Uh, and another uh, example is that suppose let's say you want to uh, predict the sentiment of a you know of a sentence. 
then uh, natural uh, ideas that maybe you can combine uh, combine the data with another uh, review uh, review data set like uh, the IMDB uh, review data set and hope that combining them together will help you know uh, augment the size of the training data set and as a result improve uh, the generalization performance. Right. So, so you know, so that's the that's the the problem. Uh, so, so now let's look at a few uh, approaches uh, for this problem. So, you know, there there are two kinds of uh, broadly speaking, speaking, two kinds of approaches for uh, multitask learning. So, one idea is called the uh, hard parameter sharing. So, the idea behind the hard parameter sharing is that you're just gonna use uh, one big uh, uh, encoder for all of the tasks, and that's the uh, the shared parameters. And then for every every task, they have a separate uh, prediction uh, prediction layer or classification layer uh, that's specifically used for that uh, particular task. Right. So here in this example, I have uh, I have two tasks. Uh, so so there's a shared encoder here, and then there's a separate prediction uh, layer for each uh, task here. So, so, so that's one idea. Uh, another idea here is called uh, soft parameter sharing. So the idea behind uh, this approach is that, uh, is that, that you're going to train one model for each task, but, uh, but in order to encourage them to be similar, so you want to uh, add some uh, constraints, right? So let's say some kind of a distance-based uh, regularization constraints to encourage them to be similar. So, so the question that you know this, that we that we try to ask in our work is, you know, when does uh, when does uh, the when do these approaches work well, and uh, when do they do they don't, right? So that's uh, so that's the motivating question. Now, you know, it turns out that when you go to the multitask learning literature, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, studies and a lot of uh, documentations about this uh, phenomenon of uh, negative transfer. So, so this phenomenon refers to situations where performing uh, multitask learning leads to worse performance than uh, single task learning, right? So, so you know, so, th so this has been uh, well documented. But uh, you know, there uh, is not, in many cases, not clear exactly why it happens and how it happened. So uh, our work provided some uh, theoretical analysis uh, for this uh, problem. So here, so here I'm going to talk about a case study of uh, of the hard parameter sharing approach. So you know, this is a very uh, very stylized uh, model where we have we we have a so you can think of this as a two-layer uh, neural network, where the first layer corresponds to the shared encoder. So that's the feature, uh, the shared feature layer. And then the second layer corresponds to the task-specific uh, output layers. So, so yeah, so that's the, that's the, that's the setup. And uh, so here, uh, in terms of the, the data, we're going to just think about the uh, uh, so think about two uh, linear regression tasks, but uh, in the paper we have some analysis for more uh, general settings. So here, let's say that we just have uh, two regression tasks. So each task, you know, has a set of features and uh, a set of labels, and let's assume that they satisfy a linear model. So just a very simple example. So then, uh, so then with the hard parameter sharing, so we we consider a loss that combines the data uh, of, combines the loss of uh, both tasks here, right? So for each, uh, for each task, here we are gonna use uh, the shared uh, layer uh, first to, uh, to, to map the input to their uh, feature representations and then map the feature representation to the output using the output layer, right? And then we measure the, the mean squared loss between the input and uh, the output, right? So, so that's the setup. And uh, you know, the question here is, uh, when does uh, uh, this uh, uh, multitask learning approach provide a transfer, a positive transfer to, uh, let's say, the, let's say the, the source task, right? So specifically, this means that uh, uh, this, this corresponds to asking that, you know, when does 
when does the uh, when does this uh, hard parameter sharing approach give you a model that uh, outperforms the you could say the ordinary uh, least squares estimator, right? So that's the so that's the question. Now it, it turned out that uh, when we look at this, it turned out that uh, the first uh, the first uh, parameter that 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 really uh, determines uh, the performance of this approach here is the capacity of the model. So here's a here's the first result from the paper. We we found that you know if the the model capacity, or in this case, it's just a two-layer uh, you know, network, so that's the width of the network. So if the width is is larger than the size of the task, the number of tasks in this case is just two, then um, multitask learning essentially reduces to single-task learning. So this means that uh, you know you could essentially encode or memorize the or uh, or hard code uh, the you know the single-task models into the uh, multi-talk model, right? So because here we're just looking at the training loss, so we could essentially uh, encode uh, the, the model for the single tasks into the shared uh, modules. Now, you know, so that's that's for this uh, setup, but we have also observed uh, a similar uh, similar phenomenon on the on real world data. So the, the idea here is that if the capacity of the model is too large, then this result implies that uh, you know there's no interference across the different tasks here. Now, on the other hand, if the capacity is too small, then these uh, leads to uh, destructive interference, right? Which uh, I'll talk about uh, in the next in the next few slides. So, so so more uh, I guess more practically speaking, one uh, rule of thumb that we we found uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, proposition here is that uh, the capacity of the of the multitask model should be less than the sum of the of all of the single task models combined. And in fact, uh, so we found that it's usually a lot smaller than that. So this this provides some uh, constraints for the for the different tasks to share their features within the multitask model. That's the uh, first. That's the first uh, observation. Now, uh, so the, you know. So the next question that uh, I, may I ask a question on the previous. Oh, thank yeah, you very much. Sure. So uh, I just wonder how did you choose the capacity for each class and also for the multitask learning? Uh, are they the uh, output dimension of the matrix B or uh, so? So how did you choose the capacity for each task? Yeah. So yeah. So this is the output dimension of B, right? Okay, so, so let's say so uh, you are saying that uh, for different tasks, uh, the output dimension for B will be different. Yeah, so yeah, so for example, uh, for example, so, so one could vary this by let's say the number of uh, hidden units, right? Okay. Uh, right, so or you say the number of uh, filters, right? Then you say you use CN. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, they dif differs a lot. So uh, have you ever tried that uh, even in a single, in, even in a single task learning, uh, like you, you choose the same uh, output dimension of B for each single class? Uh, yeah, so they do, right? So, so, so in this table, so, you know, so we, we, uh, we vary the, the capacity of, uh, you know, so in this uh, table here, what we did is uh, we, we look at, you know, what's the, the size or what's the capacity of the hidden layer so that you get the the highest uh, validation accuracy right and that's what we we that's how we determine uh, the capacity for the single task models i see i so, see yeah i see okay thank you very much yeah sure sure right all right yeah great so you know so yeah so so um so that's the, the first uh, first observation. Now, yeah. So, so next, uh, you could ask, you know, how do we, you know, how do we uh, think about, you know, this phenomenon of uh, negative transfer, right? So, so here we, you know, we we look into the uh, we call it uh, task covariance. So more broadly, so we we just we we think about the, the geometry between the say the source. And the target tasks or different tasks uh, in the in the training set. 
so 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 by geometry so i'm just uh, gonna uh, show you this uh, figure here so um so here uh you know so here we you know it's a it's a two-dimensional uh, uh example so we vary the the covariance uh, of the data and as a result this leads to different uh you know different uh, densities when you uh, generate uh, probability densities when you generate the, the generate the, the data here so so for example here uh, we think of uh, uh, the first task as the as the you know as the task that uh, we uh, that we're trying to uh, solve and then let's say we combine it with another task right so here there there are two other tasks but they have different uh, geometry compared to the first task right so we found that you know so when we vary the uh, geometry of the tasks here this leads to different uh, densities in the in the data distribution and as a result uh, you know uh, the difference in terms of the density here uh, they sometimes uh, help uh, help um, help uh, predict uh, task one and sometimes they actually hurt uh, predict uh, hurt predicting this uh, task here so it really depends on the, the geometry here so so then you know we, we went back to to the the, the two task uh, case uh, mentioned earlier so then you know so we we were interested in understanding how do these uh, data set characteristic characteristics affect uh, the the result of uh, uh, performing this uh, multitask learning right so, so here's a result from our uh, follow-up work so here we 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 found that uh, you know there there is a precise uh, asymptotic uh, formula for the for the for the for the you could say the the uh, estimation risk uh, of the uh, of the uh, the two layer network uh, when the sample size divided by uh, divided by the you know the dimension goes to a fixed uh, constant so based on that you know we could we could vary the size of the of the uh, let's say the the first tox that we are transferring from and see how that affects affects the the result on the target task right so here's the the simulation result so so here you know, you know, broad speaking, it turned out that this, you know, while this, uh, you know, this parameter of data size, data set size is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, not, I guess, not that, uh, you know, perhaps not that surprising, but we found that actually this, this uh, affects, uh, affects the, you know, whether you, whether you see positive transfer versus uh, a negative transfer uh, in a crucial way. So, for example, in the left uh, figure here. Uh, so this is a case where we found that uh, for any uh, you know for any regime of uh, data set sizes of the first task, the transfer is always positive, meaning that combining the first task with the second task will always help uh, will always help the performance for task two. And then in the in the middle part here, we found you know there are cases where uh, varying the the size of the first data set. Uh, 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 changes, uh, you know, initially it helps, meaning that it provides a positive transfer, but then after that, uh, it starts to uh, provide a negative transfer. So in other words, there is a there is a transition here, going from positive transfer to negative transfer. And thirdly, there is a regime where, where for any uh, for any regime of uh, data set sizes, it always provides a negative transfer uh, to the second task. So, so you know, it turns out that you know there is a very fine-grained uh, behavior going on here when you when you start to think about uh, combining two different uh, tasks here. So you know, so so why do we so why do we uh, go down this uh, route? You know, so um, you know, so as I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, random matrix theory are are are, are used uh, in in, uh, in a lot of the recent works. But but it it is a particularly uh, nice tool for us here because uh, this this technique provides a pre precise characterization of the the estimation risks, and this allows us to to compare uh, different uh, sample size regimes 
in a, you know in a very uh, in a in a very uh, very precise way. So, so that's the that's the reason. On the other hand, you know one could presumably look into the more uh, you know the more standard learning theoretic bounds like uh, right measure convexity bounds, but uh, those usually uh, you know, there there are some constants involved in there. So so it's uh, so it's yeah, so so, uh, so if one wants to compare the risks of different estimators, uh, it might be uh, harder. Right. So that's the you know that's the first uh, uh, parameter that we we analyzed, and the second one that we looked into is uh, you know how does uh, covariance shift affect uh, transfer, right? So covariance shift shift refers to a case where you know the two tasks here have uh, different uh, uh, feature distributions, but uh, they have the same uh, model, right? So again, so we uh, we provided a a precise uh, characterization of the estimation risk for uh, you know for for hard parameter sharing under uh, covariance shift, and and turned out our, our findings here is that you know while you you think that the uh, uh, having different uh, feature distributions might uh, might hurt uh, performance. We found that actually sometimes it helps. Uh, so, so the idea here is that when you when you combine the feature distributions of two tasks, so the idea is that let's say if the single value of uh, let's say uh, in one direction is very small, then maybe you could uh, augment uh, that direction by adding the data from another tasks. So that's uh, and that's uh, that's the piece of the uh, intuition here, All right? So uh, so so based on you know uh, as part of the, the theoretical analysis here, uh, so our work also provided a couple of uh, implications. So these are um, either uh, 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 you know you could say tools or tip that we have found to be useful uh, in practice. So. The so one is that you know in turn it seems that the size of the data set really affects uh, transfer a lot. So you know so this naturally suggests that let's say when you do multitask training, maybe you don't want to add all of the tasks, like maybe you don't want to add all of the data, and instead maybe you just want to add a subset of the data, right? So we so so you know we we had a pretty simple uh, instantiation of this idea where we. We start from a, a little of data from every task, and we gradually add more and more data from each task, right? And it turns out that this uh, this can, uh, in many cases, this can achieve a competitive uh, performance to the standard uh, multi-task training. But the benefit is that because you don't have to train with all of the data, so you can save some uh, computation, right? And of course, in the in the toy example that I gave earlier. So this way of progressively adding data could uh, provably, you know, reach the reach the the tipping point when you go from positive transfer to negative transfer, right? So this is one uh, one implication, and the other implication is that uh, um, uh, you know how do we deal with this aspect of a uh, uh, covariance shift or uh, different uh, geometries in the tasks? So, so we we uh, we we came up with a you know a really simple idea where we add a uh, alignment module between the input and the uh, you know and the model. So then after we add this uh, alignment module here, when we do uh, multitask training, we would we would train the model itself together with this alignment module. So we would ex explicitly try to align the the input, you know, you could say the covariance between the different uh, task inputs here, and it turns out that this uh, this also uh, helps uh, in practice. So, um, yeah, so there's some more. Yeah, so that's the yeah, so that's the uh, first part, and uh, yeah, so yes, yeah, so maybe maybe here I I would just pause for a second in case there are any questions. Um, can you maybe very briefly explain again? Um, so you had these plots where you compare the empirical uh, risk, I guess, with your predictions. Yeah. So yeah. 
Um, when you say empirical risk, is this like what you measured on the, on the test set? Or is this, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, so right, so you see there, there is a red line and uh, there is a, there is a, there are some uh, yellow, uh, yellow, yellow markers, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so the yellow line is measured when you take the expectation of the noise here. So right, because, okay. you know, yeah, yeah, because, you know, if there is, let's say just 100 data points, but if you, if you additionally measure the variance of the noise, then it's going to look, look like exactly yeah uh, that's what right, right so here this is yeah this is taking a uh, taking uh, expectation of the noise but not uh, in the in the input features right that's the okay. standard yeah okay well then that makes sense yeah okay. thanks yeah and yeah and the and the yellow markers uh, correspond to the predictions or the estimates that we, we we provided yeah wait a second the yellow markers i thought the red line no. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah. Sorry. You're right. Yeah. So it's the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that's uh, the first part, and uh, in the second part, I will uh, talk about uh, you know very related setting of you know after doing this uh, uh, multitask training, then the next question is how do you uh, how do you fine tune this uh, multitask uh, representation model on some target task, right? So, so you know, so, so this is based on the uh, work that appeared at uh, Europe 21, and we have a follow up paper that's currently uh, working uh, right now. So, uh, so, you know, I guess uh, the, the context here also is partly motivated by a lot of the recent practice where you, uh, you, you would, uh, when you, when you do, uh, Let's say when you want to uh, solve some uh, image or text prediction tasks, then so maybe you, what you would do instead these days is first you could download a pre-trained model that's already you know trained uh, by someone uh, and uh, and shows that shows that it works well on you know on, on some large scale data and then after downloading this model you could fine tune it on a target task right. So for example, some of the most uh, uh, widely used models here would be the resident models and uh, and the BERT models. But of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, more recent ones like CLIP and so on, right? And so the idea of, uh, uh, of fine tuning is that uh, maybe instead of uh, training from scratch, you could retrain the model. Uh, you, you could retrain you know, based on these uh, uh, pre-trained models on the target task, right? I, that's the idea. So here I'll just give you a, a illustration of the fine-tuning uh, process. So here, you know, this is just a, a very simple uh, convolutional network where we have just one convolution and one uh, uh, Mac pooling followed by a fully connected layer. So, right, so let's say that we train the model on task A. So that's uh, that's the that's indicated by the yellow line here. Now, uh, when we do fine tuning, we you know we uh, we we instead uh, use this uh, network as the initialization, and then um, and then train it again using the the target uh, using the task B here, right? So so then uh, so here you know so it makes sense to keep the weights from the layers here in the middle. Uh, but instead we would retrain the, let's say the output and maybe the input depending on the sizes of the input, right? right. So, so yeah, so, so it turns out that uh, uh, when, uh, when, you, when you do fine tuning, it's, uh, it's often the case that you, would, and the model would uh, overfit. So this happens, especially when Know, the capacity because the capacity of the model is much larger than the size of the size of the, the let's say the target task that uh, one is trying to solve right so um, so then you know so the question here is uh, is there a way to reduce the large gap here between the training and uh, the test uh, test results here right so so you know, so so various uh, previous works have uh, looked into uh, this problem. So, for example, a recent approach uh, called uh, uh, distance-based uh, regularization 
the, and the idea is that uh, uh, in this approach, uh, one could restrict you know, how far would uh, each layer of the model uh, move from the pre-trained uh, model, right? So the idea is that uh, you know, the further away you, uh, you know, the fine-tuning process goes from the pre-trained model, and then the more likely that it might, uh, it might, the more likely that it would need more data in order to, to generalize from the training data to the test data, right? And so here's a, here's a, a result for, uh, from applying uh, distance-based regularization. Uh, yeah, so, so, so you see that compared to the result from the previous, um, previous uh, figure, uh, this approach of distance-based uh, regularization could uh, 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 reduce the, uh, the gap between the test and the training uh, results by over half, right? So it's a fairly uh, effective approach. Now, so, so yeah, so, so in this part, uh, so we're going to look, look more deeply into, into the theoretical aspect of uh, this uh, uh, distance-based regulation approach. And we're going to, uh, to, to, to look into, you know, how do we, Think about uh, you know how how well would this approach generalize and so on. So so here's the problem set up. So here uh, you know so we let's say we have an L layer uh, feed for the neural network. So uh, so this this network is parameterized by a possibly nonlinear activation function at every layer, and then each layer has a a weight matrix uh, W i. So so combined together that's the that's the setting for, for the L layer uh, network. And uh, you know, so, so one could uh, formulate the distance space regulation as the false. So here we we minimize the uh, the empirical risk of the of the model uh, with uh, weight uh, W, subject to the constraint that uh, WI, uh, that's the, the weight matrix for the I layer, uh, is the most uh, distance uh, DI away. From the pre-trained, uh, uh, pre-trained uh, uh, initialization, that's uh, W I hat uh, uh, superscript uh, S, right? So in other words, you can see that this is an explicit constraint on the you know, how far how far the model could go from the uh, pre-trained uh, model here, right? So yeah, so 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 we so we, we look into uh, this uh, approach. And so you know, uh, so, so the question, the first question one might ask is, uh, how do we set these uh, distance parameters, right? So so here we 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 perform the you know, the vanilla uh, fine tuning with uh, early stopping, and we uh, we want to understand uh, you know so how how would uh, how would these uh, different uh, distance parameters uh, look like, right? And turns out that they they look uh, quite uh, nicely. Like the following, so so this is a measured on an eighteen layer uh, recent model. So it turned out that you know the model uh, stays uh, during the fine tuning process. The model stays uh, relatively close to the initialization at the the, the early layers. Uh, that's close to the input, and uh, then, and but later towards the the upper layers, it uh, it changes uh, much more. You know, now, of course, so I guess this is not really a, a much of a, a, a new finding per se, because uh, various works have sort of observed uh, similar things uh, before. Um, but at least so, you know, so this gives an idea of how one might uh, set uh, the distance uh, parameters here. And uh, second, we, you know, we also look into, uh, you know, fine tuning where we, let's say the training data set has a fair amount of uh, noisy labels. Uh, so by noisy, I just mean that uh, the training labels have been independently flipped with some uh, small probability, with, with some, some high probability. So it turns out that uh, when, the, uh, when the data set becomes uh, highly noisy, um, so, so, the, so even adding strong regulation still, you know, still uh, incurs a large gap between the training and uh, the test uh, accuracy here. So, so just doing regulation here seems like it's not, it's not able to close the, all of the gaps here. 
so, so yeah so so that's the the motivating observation that we we have so, so based on them uh in uh in the paper we uh, we provided we provided uh, two uh, two kinds of solutions uh to mitigate this overfitting problem the one is that uh, you know uh, one is that we're going to add a a regulation where the distance parameter uh, scales exponentially uh, according to the depth of the layers. So now, uh, so in this uh, regulation scheme, we have we have two parameters. One is the, the base rate that's d, and the other is the scaling uh, factor that's uh, gamma. So then, uh, when we when we uh, when we apply this regulation scheme, we just need to uh, to uh, to set these two uh, hyperparameters. And so, you know, so, so you know, the, so here one could ask, you know, how does this uh, differ from the standard uh, uh, L two regulation, for example, right? And the difference is that uh, imagine that you, you just let's say you apply a fixed uh, regulation uh, strength for all of the layers, then then based on the observation uh, uh, a few from a few slides ago, uh, that would that would just that would just uh, regularize the top layers. Because those layers move the furthest, right? So, so, but, but here with uh, with a different uh, scaling here, then we could hope that uh, this will instead regularize all of the layers instead of just uh, the top layers. So that's the that's the difference here. And the second uh, the second uh, part in response to uh, to the the presence of uh, noisy label is labels is that that we're we're going to add uh, some amount of uh, uh, pseudo labeling or uh, self training into the the algorithm. So so the the intuition is that as the model uh, uh, as the model trains uh, itself, uh, it learns some information from the from the training data set, where uh, you know where uh, we, where where they can they can then be used to uh, to further uh, reinforce. Uh, reinforce the the model predictions, right? Now, I, I should say that we don't have any uh, theory for this uh, for this part, but uh, I mean there are some uh, related works that uh, analyze uh, that analyze uh, self training heuristics. So I think this I think this will be an interesting uh, problem to look look at if one is uh, interested. So uh, combined together uh, uh, with both parts. Uh, uh, including the uh, layer-wise regulation and and uh, the, the labeling part, we can we can now actually close the gap between the training and uh, the test uh, performances here. So this is uh, so our result is indicated by the red line here. So you can see that uh, we can now close the gap here, uh, even when the data set is uh, highly noisy. And we and and you know we also apply this to various uh, different kinds of uh, uh, Tasks and uh, and the model architectures and the result uh, can be found in the paper. All right. So yeah. So so that's uh, yeah. So so that's the approach that we we take now. Uh, now, as I said earlier, so uh, we're interested in uh, understanding the you know, how does this approach uh, generalize, right? So you know. So um, uh, so so here uh, one could ask. You know what is being uh, transferred when you're doing uh, fine tuning, right? So the intuition here seems to be that uh, the, the features that uh, you're fine tuning come from the mainly come from the layers that are close to the input. So those uh, those layers they provide you know high level descriptions uh, from the from the data that are that are retained for the for the for the data set. And then, uh, and then the top layers they adapt to the downstream prediction task, right? At least that's what one could conclude uh, based on this uh, figure. Now, uh, so you know, so so here uh, we are interested in uh, you know putting on our uh, learning uh, theoretic hat and trying to uh, really understand uh, what is uh, what, for example, what is the generalization performance of uh, fine tuning. So here, uh, here we we're going to resort to uh, Bayesian bounds, uh, which which is uh, itself is crucial in studying uh, generalization uh, in uh, deep neural networks. 
So, you know, so 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 one of the the key aspect of uh, pack Bayesian analysis is uh, this notion called uh, noise stability, right? So this is from a, from a paper uh, from Aurora et al. Um, a few years ago at ICML. So, uh, so so the idea is that you know how well uh, I mean from a pack Bayesian uh, perspective, how well a model generalizes depending on uh, the model's uh, noise stability properties. So by, by noise stability here, I just mean that uh, you know, if you perturb the model by adding some uh, some amount of uh, random Gaussian noise, how would this perturbation affect uh, the loss of the affect the loss of the the model, right? So the the intuition is that if the model is uh, robust to to noise perturbations, then you will generalize uh, better according to the Pack Bayesian. Uh, framework, right? So here we we looked into uh, this uh, notion on uh, on this uh, fine tuning setting, and we found that indeed uh, if we if we uh, you know if we fine tune from a pre trained model, then it leads to uh, you know in the end it leads to trained models that are more robust to uh, to uh, noise perturbations. And in fact, there's a there's a related very related work where they they applied adversarial uh, fine, uh, adversarial training uh, during the pre-training stage, and and uh, I think this is from a paper from uh, Mattery's group. So they found that uh, uh, this adversarial uh, training actually helps uh, downstream transfer. And we also measured uh, uh, the noise stability for uh, for for these models, and it turned out they they indeed uh, um, uh, they indeed uh, lead to uh, you know, lead to uh, models that are more robust to uh, this notion of uh, noise stability. So, right. So, 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 so in our work, we, you know, our our main uh, observation is that uh, there is a strong connection between this notion of uh, noise stability and uh, the Hessian of the of the neural network. So, yeah. So, I guess so. This is just going to be my. My one slide, which has some some uh, quick, some some proof in it. So so here, uh, let's say that let's let's denote the, the noise stability as a uh, function i, which measures the difference between the expected loss of the model after adding some perturbation, uh, minus the loss itself. Right. So the claim is that uh, this uh, this quantity uh, uh, i is equal to uh, the sum of the uh, matrix product between the the covariance matrix of the noise at layer i, so that's denoted by sigma i, times the Hessian of the loss at layer i, plus some uh, some higher order uh, expansion uh, error terms, and uh, so so you know so, so the idea here is not 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 that uh, hard. So we we consider a uh, higher order expansion of the loss up to uh, the second order. And uh, and then there's a, there's a, there's a high order uh, expansion error term, and and because uh, if we add uh, let's say the Gaussian noise, then the first order uh, expansion term will be zero in expectation, right? So we are left with uh, the second order term, which which is determined by the Hessian. Now you know so maybe the first question one might ask is uh, you know is this a valid uh, is this a valid uh, approach or not? So, so we we looked into uh, you know how well would this uh, second order uh, Hessian approximation behave uh, with respect with respect to uh, the noise stability property uh, on a real world setting, and it turned out that this actually is quite uh, accurate. So here we we compared the uh, the Hessian approximation to um, to the the estimated uh, noise stability. That we measured using various levels of uh, uh, of uh, noise variance, and uh, the relative uh, residual uh, sum of squares between these two uh, results is uh, within one percent. So it means that uh, the higher order terms is actually quite small uh, when we measure it in uh, practice. So, so based on that, so so we we come up with a Hessian based uh, generalization bound where we. We characterize the generalization error of uh, fine tuning using the Hessian of the of the neural network across all the layers, and um, 
um, so so yeah, so it looks something like this, and um, and so so numerically, uh, we when we when we measure uh, measure our bound compared to previous works, it turns out that this actually this uh, this approach actually uh, matches or characterizes the empirical errors uh, quite well, and uh, and because uh, our approach here only requires measuring the Hessians. We can, we can also apply it to 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 different kinds of uh, neural networks such as uh, BERT models. So, right. So, um, yeah. So maybe I'll skip this slide since. Uh, yeah, and uh, so um, yeah. So so then uh, we we applied uh, uh, we applied our uh, Hessian based uh, approach to. To see, you know, how well would it measure uh, generalization uh, uh, in practice? So, in order to do that, we we apply the uh, our generalization bound to to uh, seven uh, seven uh, different uh, regularization methods. So, we're we're interested in understanding whether whether this uh, Hessian characterization matches the uh, empirical generalization errors accurately or not. And it turns out that it actually uh, gives a pretty nice, uh, a pretty nice match to uh, empirical uh, generalization errors uh, on on several of the All right. So yeah. So I guess I'm running a little off time. So maybe I'll skip. Should, should I? How many? How many time? How much time do I have left? Uh, ideally we have four five minutes, but uh, we, we can still go through the remaining slides. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, yeah. So here, uh, yeah, I just have a uh, one more slide. So, so here, you know, so here, uh, so, um, I, I just briefly talk about. So this is a related problem where you have, let's say, in the training data set, you have uh, several uh, groups of uh, uh, data data distributions. Uh, there are uh, potentially different. So, so, so your goal is to try to learn a, a model that uh, that is robust to these kinds of uh, uh, group shifts uh, in the training data. Um, and this is uh, this is a paper that appeared that that are presented in a, a workshop at uh, NERF last year. So, uh, so yeah, so so it's uh, it's motivated by this aspect of of uh, uh, spurious correlations uh, from uh, natural images, where you know, so oftentimes uh, you might training data might have uh, uh, features that are correlated with their labels. So, for example, so, um, so, um, so there's this uh, data set uh, which has a collection of uh, birds. Some of them uh, are water birds. Some of them are land birds. So they naturally they occur both on water and on land uh, but depending on where they occur uh, so there's a uh, for example uh, yeah so um, so so water birds they of course they occur more commonly in water right so yeah so you know so if there are different uh, groups in the data set how can we uh, how can we design a model that are robust to these kind of uh, uh, Spurious uh, correlations across groups here. So, uh, so in this work, we we came up with a contrastive learning approach, where the idea is that uh, we're going to to think about how to align the representations uh, from different uh, groups. So the idea is that, for example, if uh, if there's a water bird that appears on land versus a water bird that appears on water, you want to uh, to encourage them to have uh, similar representations, so that uh, by doing that, uh, uh, the model relies uh, less on the background information, right? Because then, then we encourage the model to be to explicitly be, uh, you know, uh, be similar, so that they yeah, they don't rely as much on the background here. And uh, yeah, so so this uh, this kind of uh, contrastive learning approach uh, actually uh, outperforms uh, the the Oracle uh, baseline uh, with uh, group DRO, where, where you have access to uh, group labels, and also uh, improves over various methods that uh, doesn't have uh, group labels. Right. So, so just to uh, summarize the talk here, so, 
So, uh, so, um, so here, in terms of uh, theoretical contributions, we uh, we stated uh, uh, two results. So one is uh, we provided uh, some high dimensional asymptotics for uh, heart parameter sharing models, and here the key focus here is that uh, we we look into how uh, data set sizes and uh, covariate shifts affect uh, the result of uh, heart parameter sharing. And the second uh, result is that we provided some packed Bayesian bounds uh, for deep networks. So here, uh, our idea is to use uh, Hessian to measure uh, generalization. And this, uh, this approach also naturally applies to, uh, to dealing with uh, noisy labels. And then in terms of uh, algorithmic uh, contributions, so we, we talk about uh, various things to deal with uh, uh, covariate shift, uh, uh, model shift, uh, and uh, group shifts, and so on. So, right. And uh, this is the reference for, for my talk today. Yeah. yeah, thanks. That's all I have. Thanks, Professor John. Uh, I think this talk is great.